Yep, you have stage three cervical cancer. It turns out it was not a fibroid, but cancer. I was misdiagnosed all this time. Thank you for joining us again for part two of this very important discussion. If you've missed part one, we advise you to go back to get more details on the management of fibroids. In this episode, we're going to focus primarily on cervical cancer. There's so much to talk about, you guys. Make sure you get comfortable because we're going deep. As a reminder to our listeners, we do not have access to medical records. We only have access to what is shared publicly. Please remember to click subscribe. So we're going to talk about a few things. One of the things before I get into cervical cancer, I do want to make sure that everyone is very clear that Jessica died basically a little bit over a year from the time of her diagnosis of cervical cancer. This is not typical. And it is very important to know that even though it wasn't shared in her main post, in the some of the com- public communication, it was disclosed that she chose not to be treated. Jessica relied on her faith for the healing of her cervical cancer. That is the walk that she chose. Um, and so some of the information that I'm sh- going to share about cervical cancer and the survivor rates doesn't pertain to someone who has not been treated. I will be sharing information with the assumption that the individual is being actively treated for cervical cancer. Cervical cancer is a very slow growing cancer, taking an average of anywhere from 15 to 20 years, depending on the sources you use. But most people agree it's somewhere between 15 to 20 years from the time that your cells become abnormal to the time of developing actual frank cervical cancer. It's very important to know that. And that is why cervical cancer is one of the cancers in which a screening can actually be effective because a screening has the time between the onset of disease to possibility of cancer that is so long that it gives us the opportunity to get rid of those abnormal cells rapidly in between to prevent the actual outcome of cervical cancer. So that's why cervical cancer is eligible to have a screening process. One, because of the efficacy of treatment and two, because of this long duration that exists between the standard cervical cancer and the initial onset of abnormal cells. So let's get into some of the really key details about cervical cancer. It was estimated in the U.S. in 2003 that 13,690 individuals were diagnosed with invasive cervical cancer. In worldwide, 604,127 women were diagnosed with cervical cancer, not just invasive, like the data I just gave you. So it's important to pay attention also to what type of data I'm giving you. So the first data in the U.S. was invasive cervical cancer, and that's 13,690 women in 2023 worldwide. It is over 604,000 women, but this is cervical cancer collectively, invasive and non-invasive cervical cancer. And that stat is from 2020. So there are different types of cervical cancer, and the far majority are going to be your squamous cell cervical cancer, but there's also adenocervical cervical cancer, which derive from the glandular cells of the cervix. And then there's also people who have mixed type cervical cancer. Um, over 90% are going to be your squamous cell cancer. And those are the cancer cells that line the cervix. So what are the risk factors? So oftentimes you go to GYN or you go to a family medicine doctor or a a nurse practitioner or physician assistant, and they will ask you questions on your intake, such as your sexual history. And your sexual history is really important to determine your risk factors for sexual for sexually transmitted infections, one of which is human papillomavirus. Human papillomavirus, at some point, most Americans, most people around the world will be infected with the human papillomavirus because it is so easily transmitted. It is so common. And unfortunately, Outside of those, you have the subtypes that causes general warts. For the most part, the high-risk types that then lead on to cancers have no symptom. This, again, is why cervical cancer is a candidate for screening because the underlying etiology of the underlying cause is asymptomatic. If the underlying cause is symptomatic, then there really is no point of a screening process. So I'm going to give you 
keys as I talk today about what makes cervical cancer as opposed to uterine cancer and ovarian cancer a key cancer that can actually um, be eradicated, hopefully that's the goal. And it is feasible. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit, um, by doing a screening process. And so when we talk about, let's talk about the screening process, because that's also been a source of confusion. So this is the vagina, right? And at the at the top here, you will have the cervix. So if you were to look inside with a speculum, as we often do on a pelvic exam, you will see the cervix way up there at the upper end, or what we call the apex of the vagina, the upper end of the vagina, right? The cervix helps to connect the vagina to the uterus. It's an anchor point, right? Now, when we do a pelvic exam, Again, I shared with you all the organs that are in the pelvis. So depending on what someone's coming in to be evaluated for, a pelvic exam can be an evaluation of their bladder, evaluation of their GI system, or an evaluation of their reproductive organs. It doesn't necessarily mean that it includes a pap smear. It is very important to know the distinction between the two. A pelvic exam we may be, if we're focusing on your GYN organs, then we are your reproductive organs. We may be checking for the size of your uterus. We may be checking for your adnexa, which includes your tubes and your ovary, making sure they're not tender, making sure they're not um, enlarged. We may also be checking for one of the other organs that I mentioned. Um, but when we are doing a pap smear and we insert a speculum into the vagina, which as you can see, is pretty much a canal, then we're able to view the cervix and with a brush, this is not a brush, but we're going to simulate with a brush that's inserted into the cervix. So the brush goes all the way up to where the cervix is. We're going to twirl it around and we're going to collect some cells and put that in a liquid and that gets sent out to the laboratory. Now, what are the recommendations? Depending on your age group, the recommendation is either to have your, your cervical cell screening either every three years for the youngest age group or every five years for those who undergo co-testing, which is testing that includes looking at the cells themselves, as well as looking at whether or not you have HPV. If both are negative, then the repeat testing will be done in five years. That is not the pelvic exam. That is only the part of the pelvic exam that includes your pap smear. Okay, so that is only guidelines for pap smear. So women who have other type of conditions in the pelvis, women who have fibroids, for example, women who have pelvic pain issues, women who have bladder issues, women who have incontinence issues may undergo annual visits in terms of monitoring or diagnostic evaluation for other types of concerns. Because again, you can have fibroids and another condition, or you can have cervical cancer and another condition. You can have cervical dysplasia, which is abnormal cells of the cervix and other conditions. So one does not equal the other, nor does one cancel out the other. You can go in for your pap smear with a pelvic exam. You can go in just for cervical cell sampling for those who are being monitored for abnormal pap smears that don't necessarily include a full evaluation of the pelvis. Or you can go in for a pelvic exam that does not include a pap smear. So make sure when you are being evaluated by your by your primary care provider or your gynecologist that you are aware as to whether or not you're due for a cervical cell sampling or you're due for a pelvic exam or both. It is recommended that you have an annual exam. And here's the caveat. We do also a bimanual exam, right? You will see us put one hand in the vaginal area, one hand on top of the abdomen, and we're gonna be feeling your organs during that exam, right? Here's the thing. Studies have not been conclusive as to whether or not in the group of women that are asymptomatic, meaning you don't have a history that includes any sexually transmitted infections, you don't have fibroids, you don't have abnormal cancer cells, you don't have anything, or you don't have a high-risk history in your family of anything. So you go in 
for your annual visit so that we can go over your contraception, for example, your sexual history, for example, to assess what your risk factors are or to see if you have any complaints at all. If you don't have any complaints, the studies have not been consistent as to whether or not we actually need to do that pelvic exam. There's no solid evidence against or for that exam. So that warrants a discussion between you and your provider, whether or not you're going to have a pelvic exam as a part of your annual visit or whether or not you don't need it. And here's the thing too, you don't need a pelvic exam for contraception either. So the initiation or the prescribing of a contraception with the exception of IUD does not warrant a pelvic exam either. Now that we've got that cleared and hopefully I've cleared up some of the misconceptions, let's talk about what are some of the risk factors for cervical cancer. So when we ask about your sexual history, we may ask things like, how old were you when you started to have sex? How many partners have you had? And those are partners in general, not just those partners that you've had vaginal sex with, but inclusive of partners you've had any type of sex with, whether it's oral, anal, or vaginal, or a combination of the above. We also want to know how many partners you've had in the recent months. We have also want to know what is your partner's exposure to? Do you have partners who've had multiple other partners? Because their sexual history also is included in your sexual history because their risk factors become your risk factors. We wanna know if you use barrier methods of protection when you do have sex. And we wanna know other things like, have you used birth control pills? Hmm, why do we ask about that in particular? When it comes to cervical cancer, while birth control pills can improve someone's risk factor for other types of cancers, like uterine cancer or ovarian cancer, it does increase the risk if used more than five years for cervical cancer. So birth control pills gives you the benefit of preventing some cancers, but in terms of cervical cancer, it is considered to be a risk factor with prolonged use. And it's also important that we don't make assumptions, right? For, so women who are heterosexual may have men who are not heterosexual, who may be bisexual, and men having sex with men are a risk factor for a number of sexually transmitted infections because it's considered to be a higher risk population. That being said, it's also important to denote that women who may be lesbians may not only have partners who are also lesbians, their partners can also be bisexual as well. It's important not just to report your own sexual preference, but also if you have knowledge of the sexual preferences of your partners, that is important also to assess your risk factors. So cervical cancer I mentioned is a slow growing cancer with exceptions. So faster growing cancer or more aggressive cancers are seen in people who have a weakened immune system. So women who have HIV or some type of autoimmune condition that, that compromises their immune system, because again, HPV is responsible for more than 90% of cervical cancers, and HPV is a virus. So if you have an immune system that is compromised or weakened, then it allows the virus to be more aggressive, to be more active and to cause those oncogenic genes. And so for women who have HIV or maybe on immune suppressive medications because they are transplant patients, for example, or may have autoimmune conditions, they are at higher risk for developing cervical cancer in a shorter duration. There are other things that are considered to be uh, contributory factors in women and having cervical cancer, such a lower socioeconomic um, status, women who have obesity. Uh, obesity is thought to affect cervical cancer. And then talk about smoking. That's a direct risk factor. So add that to the direct risk factors to stop smoking. Smoking doesn't help anyone. But also women who were exposed in utero to DES. DES is a medication that was used to help women with fertility issues, to prevent miscarriages. Now, your, your mom would have had to use DES between the years of 1948 and 1971 in order for that to be a risk factor to you. Um, so if your mom got pregnant with you much later than that, chances are you were not exposed to DES. And if your mom didn't have pregnancy issues or pregnancy losses or fertility issues, chances are you were not exposed to DES. Before we go on, let's talk about what are some of the symptoms of cervical cancer. Um, so as I share these, you'll realize that there are crossover between symptoms for cervical cancer and symptoms for other kind of conditions, right? And so symptoms of cervical cancer may include abnormal vaginal bleeding, especially vaginal bleeding between cycles, vaginal bleeding after intercourse, pain with intercourse is also more common, and unusual discharge 
such as a watery, bloody, strong odor discharge is more common with cervical cancer. So again, these are very nonspecific symptoms, but again, symptoms that should alert you to pursue additional evaluation. That's really the key of our message today. So Jessica shared that she had stage three cervical cancer. Let's talk about that. So stage three cervical cancer includes cancer that may have extended to the lower third of the vagina. So as I mentioned before, the cervix is up here, right? It's on the inside of the vagina, so you won't be able to see it. So women who have um, stage three have cancer that has extended to the lower third, the most distal portion of the vagina. It also includes women who have some type of kidney dysfunction or hydronephrosis, uh, dilation of the draining system of the kidneys, women who have extension to the regional pelvic node system, and women who have extension of the cancer to the pelvic wall. These are all criteria that qualify for stage three cancer, stage three cervical cancer. Um, important to know that there are different staging systems. So when I'm talking about a staging system in terms of survival rate, I'm going to be using a system that's different from the FIGO system, which I just described. When we translate stage three into the SEER system, which is the surveillance epidemiological and results of systems, I hope I got the, that acronym correctly, um, that system will then do localized disease, regional disease, and distal disease, right? And so her disease system, stage three, translate into a regional disease. So local disease will be that which is isolated to the cervix. It hasn't extended to any other tissue type, um, hasn't extended to neighboring tissues, and certainly has not extended to more distant organs. So the key with cervical cancer, which again, makes it a good candidate for a screening test is because treatment is effective. If it's caught early where it's localized to the cervix, the survival rate, according to the SEER system, is 91%. This is why pap smears are so important. It's important to know when your pap smear is due, what your last pap, pap smear was, and whether or not your history of diagnosis on your pap smear, pap smear warrants more frequent evaluations. Some of you may have had colposcopy, for example. I didn't touch on copo today, but any abnormal pap smear that is considered to be a high-risk finding will then proceed to colposcopy. Maybe we'll talk about those details in another video. But we did do a video on HPV. So if you didn't catch that video, make sure you go back and check the video on HPV because I talked extensively about the HPV virus. So localized cancer caught early, meaning early diagnosis, can lead to a very high five-year survival rate of 91%. When there is regional disease, that drops to from 91% to 60% survival rate. So that's basically in the range of where Jessica was had she received treatment for her cancer. For those who have the unfortunate experience of having more distal disease, meaning it has spread to more distant organs, then that survival rate drops to from 60% down to 19%. Overall, considering all groups and all stages of cervical cancer, the overall survival rate cumulatively is 67%. So still a very effective treatment options for cervical cancer, very effective in prolonging life and increasing your survival rate. That's important to know. And so one of the things we want to talk about is the unfortunate death rate. Um, in light of um, Jessica's story. So it's important to kind of get a sense of how lethal cervical cancer is. It is not the most lethal form of GYN cancers. It is important to know that it's estimated that 4,310 deaths are due to cervical cancer in the United States in 2023. It is also important to know that similar to the incidence rates, the death rate in the United States also dropped by 50% since the mid 1970s. And this is partly due to the screening process. The screening for cervical cancer has made a drastic difference in decreasing not just the incidence of cervical cancer, but also decreases the likelihood of death as a result of cervical cancer. Again, because if you're screening for something, you're more likely to detect early onset disease. One of the things that has also caught attention as a result of her story is the fact that there is disparities also in cervical cancer management and treatment. Studies have shown that Black women have a 65% higher death rate from cervical cancer compared to white women. 
and both groups have very similar screening rates. So an indication that there are other areas in which disparities are impacting the outcomes. So I already shared with you the overall five-year survival rate for the general population that's affected by cervical cancer. And the five-year survival rate is a comparison of those with out disease compared to those with the with disease, right? And so the overall survival rate for all stages of cervical cancer is 67%. However, for black women, the survival rate is only 56%. Um, so again, there's still evidence of continued uh, disparities in the outcomes of cervical cancer, even though both groups have similar screening rates. The other thing that's also warrants further investigation, I also mentioned earlier in this video that squamous cell cervical cancer is responsible for more than 90% of the cervical cancer that's diagnosed. Well, of interest in the, is the fact that adenocarcinoma, which is derived from the glandular cells, um, are actually resulting in a higher mortality rate in Black women. So what's interesting is Black women with cervical adenocarcinoma are more likely to die from that, even though Black women have a lower incidence of this type of cancer. In fact, Black women have the lowest incidence of cervical adenocarcinoma, yet the highest death rate related to it. So there was a report that came out a couple of years ago that started to look at these disparities. It's an 82-page report that's entitled, We Need Access, Ending Preventable Deaths from Cervical Cancer in Rural Georgia. So why is this important? I mentioned before in another video, we talked about maternity deserts, right? And we talked about the growing number of shortage of women's health providers, but we talked about it in perspective to obstetrical care. But it's important to know that the same people that provide obstetrical care also provide gynecological care. So if there's maternity deserts, then those maternity deserts are subsequently going to affect gynecological diseases just the same. And we also talked about the certain populations that are more likely to be affected by these maternity deserts let's just say women's health deserts. Um, and among that group are the minoritized groups, the, the also the rural population. And so in this post-reversal of Roe versus Wade, why is this key? It's key because depending on where you are living and what the what the determination of the state is and how they're going to manage the reversal of that decision has led to in some of these states a relocation of women's health providers. So when we were already facing maternity desert and a shortage of women's health providers in certain populations as a result of other factors, now that you can add the, the effect of the Supreme Court ruling, we have even more displacements of providers who have relocated to other states, to other communities, because they cannot safely practice in the populations they were once in because of the potential litigation, potential facing of, of imprisonment and fines. Um, and so now in these disadvantaged communities, you have an either growing decrease in access. And this particular report that was done on their rural population in Georgia highlighted a couple of areas. I call them the three A's. They found that in the population, there was a decrease awareness. So a lot of women in the population didn't even know that there was a vaccine for HPV. And this is critical because the vaccine has been shown in recent reports to be effective in decreasing the rates of cervical dysplasia and subsequently cervical cancer. So we are actually looking at the possibility, if we get our acts together, between screening and immunization, we can actually eradicate cervical cancer. And that's important for the public to know. What they also found in this report is that access was an issue, as I just mentioned. So they have a population that's not adequately informed about treatment options, the need for screening, and also the option of immunization, which now has been extended to age 45. That's important for you to know if you're interested in being immunized against the high-risk HPV virus strains that are most responsible for cervical cancer. Um, but they have also mentioned the lack of accountability. So there was no accountability to the healthcare system to ensure that people are informed and that there is an effort to increase access on a public health policy basis.
And so the three A's are responsible for some of these disparities in this particular report. There may be other factors, and we definitely, with the new Women's Health Research Initiative by the White House, this is definitely an area that should be considered is looking at the disparities in outcomes of cervical cancer because it is a potential disease we can effectively eradicate with the right policies, the right intervention, the right public health awareness, and the right access. So this report said we need three things. We need access, we need awareness, and we need accountability. I think they hit the nail on the head. So the other thing we're going to talk about very briefly is what happens when you have fibroids and you had fibroid surgery. That was a part of her story that I'm not going to spend as much time on. Um, we could perhaps touch on it on another time. But I do want to say, in terms of being an advocate, so we talked about advocate, advocating for new symptoms or severe symptoms of disease or having even a discussion to understand why the determination is that you do have fibroids um, or that you or what the management of your cervical dysplasia or abnormal cervical cells is. What, what is my likelihood of developing cervical cancer? These are all ways of advocating, having the conversation with your provider so that you have adequate information about how to better manage and also self-monitor uh, your health care. And also for those who want additional ways of advocating and monitoring your own disease process, keep in mind that when you have any type of surgery, any type of organ is removed or any type of tissue is removed from your body. The majority, some things that are done in the office may not necessarily go to pathology, but for the things that are done in the operating room, they go to a pathologist, which means a pathologist is then going to look at your tissue and determine whether or not your tissue is malignant, meaning cancer, cancerous, or whether or not your tissue is benign, meaning non-cancerous, or has a malignant potential. It's not malignant, but it's in a category that increases your potential for becoming cancerous tissue. When you have your surgery, it is okay to ask for a copy of the pathology report. The operative report is important because you should know what procedure you actually had. Was it what was planned or what was potentially planned. So sometimes we can send for an intended procedure, but something else is encountered and you would ha likely have already been encountered already been consented for the possibility of other procedures. So it's important to know what exactly you had done, what organs were removed, what tissue was removed. And when you do your post-op appointment, uh, meaning the appointment in which you are getting that official clearance to return to your normal level of activity, part of that appointment should be, what did the pathology report show? Can I have a copy of the pathology report or can we go over the pathology report together? That is important so that you know, okay, I saw the pathology report. It confirmed what I had was actually fibroids. And that way you can rest assured of knowing you're fine. Um, in terms of other types of findings, so they may, for example, you may have a uterine condition and you and your provider decide to take out your tubes, for example. It's also important to know that the tubes were healthy. So it's not just looking at the tissue that you intended that is the source of your condition, but also looking at other tissue that may have been removed. You wanna know what the outcome of those tissues are. So that being said, take home for today. I gave you ways in which you can advocate for yourself. I gave you some indications in which you may warrant additional testing, even if you have a known diagnosis of fibroids or some other benign non-cancerous condition that can cause bleeding or pelvic pain. Um, I also reviewed with you the importance of knowing about HPV. Make sure you check out our other video. Okay. And then also we talked about cervical cancer in terms of its survival rate, uh, risk factors for cervical cancer. Again, knowing your sexual history, um, smoking, um, your your overall health, your immune status are factors in the risk factors for, for cervical cancer. We also talked about the disparities in Black women when it comes to cervical cancer and the need for further research to understand if both groups are getting screened equally, why is there such a disparity in terms of the survival rate of Black women? And we also talked about ways in which you can additionally advocate for yourself in the understanding of cervical cancer. We talked about the fact that in this particular case, she was not treated. So the information provided 
in terms of survival rates is based on those who are treated for cervical cancer. If you decide to not be treated for a certain disease, uh, then also it's important to um, make sure that you have all the information you need to make that crucial decision and that very difficult decision. Actually, one more thing before we go. Make sure if you have a condition that was evaluated in the emergency room that you are followed up by a physician or clinician who can continue the evaluation of your ER care. The emergency room is literally just for stabilization and the diagnosis and treatment of acute illnesses that are severe. If you are not severe or it doesn't warrant emergent care, again, emergency is for emergencies. The emergency room is for emergencies, for stabilization and for the treatment of severe or life-threatening care. It is not a place for continued care or diagnostic workup. There are certain things that are done in the emergency room to assess your stability, your safety, before warranting you safe to be discharged or whether or not you need admission for further care. It is not the place that is going to ultimately decide or determine what your chronic condition or your acute illness is. When you go to the emergency room and they tell you follow up with your physician or your clinician in the next week or in the next two to three days, <laughs> Please follow those instructions because it's really critical in someone being able to evaluate what took place in the emergency room. Were you adequately evaluated or is there a need for additional evaluation and care? It is so important that you have that continuity of care between the emergency room and your ongoing provider, your primary care provider, your GYN care, or in some cases, your mental health provider. Make sure there's no gap between your care. That is what ultimately saves lives, is the continuity of care between the emergency room and whoever your chronic care provider is. We do send our condolences to the family of Jessica Pedway. We thank you also for keeping her story up because they didn't have to do that. So we thank you for keeping her story up so we can all learn from her story. It's important also when we see these stories on social media that we go to a source that can gain in which we can gain additional insight. Because one of the things that was not shared was the fact that she was not really publicly shared in a lot of the posts is the fact that she opted out of treatment, which is critical because we don't want those who have cervical cancer to feel that there is no hope. There is lots of hope. Um, and we also want those who are concerned about their possibility of developing cervical cancer because perhaps of their sexual history to know that there are ways to decrease your likelihood of de developing cervical cancer, making sure you minimize getting exposed to HPV. So protect yourself, safe sex practices, minimize your exposure to multiple partners. And also making sure your immune system is at its optimal best as much as you can to the best of your ability. And also optioning for immunization against HPV is really important. And of course, the most critical part of preventing cervical cancer is the screening of a pap smear. So I am Dr. T, the hand behind the handle of Healthy Bump Club right here on YouTube. And also the hand behind the handle of Healthy Bump Club dot club on instagram we thank you for watching make sure you check out our other videos especially our videos on fibroids and on hpv and on sexually transmitted infections right here on our channel we thank you for supporting us and we look forward to seeing you when the next episode rest in peace jessica padway